how God works by history and prophecy. I guess that uh, all of us here are either going through school or have gone through school and done our history lessons, so we know a little bit about history and what that means. But perhaps if we just start with that first and just refresh ourselves about what we mean when we say history. There are two views of human history that are really out there for us to put our allegiance to. Uh, the one is grounded in the Enlightenment and insists that history is a closed process whose course is determined by the dictum that might makes right. Okay, this is uh, the uh, definition that I found by uh, an individual who just suggested that history is where the more powerful dictate the events that take place and overrun the less powerful. And, and I guess if you look at how uh, the ages of history have transpired, that's pretty much what it is. But the other view is the one we want to look at tonight. The other view is that it is an act of supernaturalism which regards every event in history as a direct act of God. Now, both views are out there. Which one is true? Well, that's what we want to have a look at tonight. That God orchestrates and directs all the events or that it's simply, you know, might makes right the uh, everything's left to chance. Now, when we come to history, uh, how, how can we prove history? How do we know what's happened in the past? Well, uh, I guess um, recent history, you can go to different books that have been written. There's plenty of documentation through letters and records, etc., that you can go into libraries and museums and, and, and find a record of recent history. If you go back further, some of that starts to be impossible because paper wasn't around back then. So, you know, libraries consisted of stone gravings and uh, tablet form, and, and many of those have corroded and disappeared. So archaeologists use uh, their methods to dig the ground and look for artifacts and things that people used back then to try and identify the period of time and, and what went what went on and what happened. And of course, when we come to the Bible, the Bible is in the main a historical book. It, it records history, lots of history in the Bible. And it mentions historical places, it mentions historical people, it mentions historical culture, and it mentions historical events. Now, some of those archaeologists have found and discovered, and some of them they haven't. And it's some of these ones that haven't been found that people say, ah, oh, there you are, it never happened because there's no evidence for it. So here's the challenge for tonight. We're going we're gonna to be trying to look at and, and answer. Is the absence of evidence proof that evidence is absent? In other words, if you can't find the evidence, does that mean the evidence is not even there? Well, for some people, that's the way they take it, especially for some events that they say are impossible, uh, things that are miraculous, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, for example. There's no evidence, they say, so therefore it never happened. Is the absence of evidence a cause to say that the evidence will remain forever absent? It's a play on the words, but it's the key issue for tonight. Do we need proof of every statement made in the Bible before we can say it's true? So before we sort of delve into some of these things, I just want to give some illustrations of where we would sample some things and then form an opinion based on those samples. And we don't need to then go and question every single incident to get a fair idea. So, for example, every election there's polling that takes place and a sample of the population is taken to see where people are at. Okay, now sometimes the sample isn't big enough to give 
a real picture. But sometimes the sample becomes overwhelming that, you know, a landslide's about to happen. Or maybe uh, you work in a company that specializes in a product and you're in quality control. So you're in the department that has to test. I don't know, it might be a loaf of bread that comes down and every now and then you take one loaf and you sample it, don't you? You, you look at the, the two ends and you might sample the middle and if you find no mold in the ends or the middle, you assume the whole loaf doesn't have mold. So from that, from that sample, you can then sort of uh, imply that the rest of the loaf is, is okay and, and, and it can go out to the population and be digested. No one's going to die from it. There was no mold in the, in the sampling. Well, that's what history is like. You, you take a, a sample of all these different things and you say, well, that part's true and that part's true and that part's true. The bits we don't know, well, we take, we take a very good calculated idea that the Bible was true in those areas too until we find evidence. Now, we're going to do that tonight. We're going to do a little bit of a journey. We're going to sort of uh, walk in the footsteps a little bit of the McGeorge family when we went overseas and, and visited a lot of these places uh, in Israel, but in museums in Britain, in the British Museum in London, and also in uh, Paris, in the Louvre, and in Rome. The, the story of history is spread out across the world. You can visit these places and put the story together. Let's start, though, by going to a verse that sets the scene for us in Hebrews 11. Over in the New Testament, Hebrews 11, the apostle here, in a chapter about faith, okay? So faith becomes the key ingredient. And he says this in verse 1 to 3. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, that's interesting right from the start. Okay, what can you recognize in that verse? What does faith sort of uh, encompass? Well, it encompasses things hoped for. I'm going to suggest that that's future events, but it also encompasses things that aren't seen but are there, whether that's in the past or the present. So historical things, evidence. Evidence is stuff that you either dig up or you find to prove something happened. So faith is the same as having the evidence of a historical fact. You know, if you were to go to a law court and a case is going on, and the judge says, okay, it's time to bring forth the evidence. And you bring forth the evidence about the case, and it might be a traffic accident, if it's a minor thing, or it might be something to do with uh, burglary, and, and you bring the evidence, you show the proof of the historical event, and both sides are trying to weigh up what does the evidence actually mean. Well, faith does that, but it's not blind faith. It's not just, well, forget about the evidence, Faith does that sampling that I was talking about. Faith looks at all of those things and says, I understand all of those, but the bits that I can't see, faith fills the gaps. And that's what we as Christadelphians believe the Bible has sufficient evidence for us to then use faith to fill the gaps. It's not blind faith. It's not just, uh, well, God said it, so therefore it must have just happened. We look at the evidence as much as we can, and there's really overwhelming evidence that faith really only has to fill a small of those gaps in regards to uh, the historical section. And then we're going to see how it then becomes a very good platform for the things that are being predicted for in the future. Now, verse three, the apostle goes on to really zone in on the evidence part, on the past. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. 
Now this word worlds, it actually is the Greek word aeon. It means the ages. And by that, we're not talking about the world in its natural form. We're talking about the different periods of time that have come and gone on the earth. The different time periods. Okay, the different ages. The Bible talks about the Jewish age and the Gentile age. But then there's the medieval age. There's the modern age. There's the industrial age. There's all these ages. This verse is saying that God controlled all of them. He brought them into existence and he brought them about in the way that he wanted. So whether it's about things in the past or things in the future, this is saying that God orchestrated it. He designed it. So I guess that then sort of opens up, well, they, there's history being presented, but future events well, that's prophecy. And so the second half of our title is about prophecy. And prophecy is the ability to predict the future with exactness, not just a, a fair guess or even a calculated guess. You know what the weatherman does, does a very good calculated guess. OK, and we're looking at Easter weekend. And, and at the moment, the calculated guess, it's going to be a good weekend. The weather's looking nice. But, but who knows 100 percent? But it does look like we could rely on that because we're, we're only seven days out. But if we went back a week ago or two weeks ago, you'd be saying, well, I don't know that I can trust that. No, prophecy is about foretelling future events hundreds of years before they happened with exactness. So that's quite remarkable. So we want to test that tonight as well. Let's go back to... Isaiah that, that many read tonight. There's actually a section here in Isaiah, chapter 43 being part of it, that goes from chapter 40 to chapter 48. In this section, we have this idea of future events and past events being brought together and God saying, I design it all. All right, so here they are. Not sure if we better read all of those, but you may like to jot them down or color them and look for these familiar phrases. Okay, Isaiah 41. Let's look at this one first. Verse 21 to 22. So God's laying down a challenge in this section. Produce your cause. Where's your evidence? And that's the word we came across earlier, isn't it? Where's your evidence? Bring forth your strong reasons. Bring forth your best evidence, saith the king of Jacob. Let them bring them forth and show us what shall happen. Let them show the former things. In other words, history. Tell us why history has taken the course that it has. Why have those events been exactly like that? Give us the reason why history has happened like that and what they be that we may consider them. And know the latter end of them or declare us things for to come. So here's both God saying, look, if you can tell me why history took that path or what's going to come into the future, you've got a leg to stand on. But if you can't do that, if you can't produce any evidence. Then just sit back and let me show you what I can do. OK, so this idea goes all the way through. Chapter 42, verse 9, sometimes it's uh, simpler, sometimes it's more involved. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you. I don't tell you about them after they happened. I tell you about them long before they happened. Chapter 43, which many read for us tonight, brings one of these... Uh, verses together in the context of the nation of Israel. Verse 9, let all the nations be gathered together and let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this? Who can project the future? Who can tell us about things to come? Who can declare this and show us former things, things that have happened in the past, why they've happened the way they've happened? Why has the nation of Israel taken the path that it has? 
that ye, uh, sorry, uh, let them bring forth their witnesses. Bring forth their evidence that they may be justified. Or let them hear and say, it's true. God is true. Okay, so chapter 46 and 48 say the same thing. All the way through. Do you know any prophets living at the moment? And I, I mean, you know, fair dinkum prophets. Well, here's an interesting thing. In America, there are the evangelical movement, many of whom proclaim to be prophets. They can tell the future with exactness, with question marks and quotations around that word exactness. Well, here's, uh, I haven't put all the prophecies, you can go and search these for your own interest if you like, but prophets went out on a, on a limb and said, President Trump will win the next election. Okay, and, and of course, November 3rd came and he, and he didn't. So then he said, well, it's going to happen on January the 6th. Definitely the certification of the college vote will be overturned and Trump will be president. And that didn't happen. There were riots instead. And then they said, well, no, on inauguration day, January the 20th, that will be when President Trump will, go for, will, will start his second term. Well, that came and went. And uh, March the 4th was the next date, because March the 4th was the original inauguration date when they had stagecoaches and, and not the modern transport and things went slower, so they had more time to prepare. It got moved to January the 20th in recent times. So that was the new date, and that came and went. And then March the 20th. Now, no one knows why March the 20th. Can't find a reason for March the 20th. That was unknown as to why they said this date, but of course that's come and gone. So we don't know what the next date is, but now the next date for some of them is uh, 2024. But, but you can go and chronicle all of that, and some of them actually apologised and said we got it wrong, but others dug their heels in and said, no, 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 we, uh, God's still doing this and he's working with us. Here's uh, one of the ladies, this was uh, Paula White, Donald Trump's spiritual counsellor his personal spiritual counsellor. And uh, <laughs> I won't read all of that, but she, 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 she made a prayer. And this prayer, and here she is down here, chanting away. And this prayer, she declared victory for Trump and that the angels over in, uh, from Africa, from South America, angelic forces were brought over to help Trump win the election. And she, she brought all that help over and uh, apparently, it was all done and dusted. And of course, this is now history. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't happen the way she anticipated. But there's one interesting thing about the prophecies that modern day prophets so-called are saying about Trump. I don't know if anyone came across this one here. Trump, a modern day King Cyrus. Benjamin Netanyahu called President Trump a modern day King Cyrus because when he declared the embassy to be moved to Jerusalem from Tel Aviv, the declaration of Trump in December of 2017, that was a major thing. No president had done that, even though the Congress had agreed it, they kept on just overruling it until Trump came and said, let's not overrule this anymore. Let's just let it happen. And Netanyahu and others on the evangelical side said, that's very much like a continuation of Cyrus the Great's declaration to allow Jews to return home and to rebuild the temple. And it's been commemorated on a new coin. And you can see the coin on the one side, it's got Trump and Cyrus side by side. And on the back of it, it's got a picture of the new temple. And uh, you can see the image there of Cyrus next to the image there of, of Trump. That's quite a remarkable statement to make. Now, they're not necessarily prophesying that uh, Donald Trump is King Cyrus. Some of them are in the, in the vein of, 
but they're making this comparison. Now, the reason this is interesting is because when we come back to this section of Isaiah, so this section of Isaiah, we said, was from chapter 40 to 48, yeah? So this section, God says, I can tell the past, why it took the, the, the way it did, and I can tell the future. All right, now, let me show you my proof, he says. That there's two proofs that God gives in Isaiah 40 to 48. There, there are two main prophecies. One of them concerns Cyrus. God's ability to predict the birth and the rise of Cyrus the Great and how he would deliver God's people from Babylon. And it's so exact, it's so precise. And yet it was hundreds of years, at least 120 to 150 years before the event took place. The second main prophecy, we've already alluded to it in Isaiah 43, is about Israel. God predicts the calamities, but also the preservation of his people Israel, calling them his witnesses to his existence. If you can get rid of Israel, then I don't exist. And yet there they are still in the Middle East, and they've been through a lot. For a small nation, they've been through enormous amounts of calamities. They shouldn't exist anymore. Some call them the eternal candle. You know, a candle should normally just burn out or blow out with the wind, you know? But if you had a candle that never went out, that's what the nation of Israel is like. A miracle shouldn't be there. Well, that's because they are my witnesses that I exist, says God. So let's take this first one, Cyrus. So, Cyrus. He was prophesied of 120 to 150 years before he was born. Isaiah, writing Isaiah here, was 120 to 150 years before Cyrus came on the scene, okay? So Cyrus was born about 580 BC, and Isaiah prophesied in about 750 to 700 BC. So at least 120 years, but probably longer, because Isaiah, uh, when he wrote his prophecy, wrote his prophecy during the time period of Hezekiah not during the time period of Manasseh, which is uh, Isaiah lived into the reign of Manasseh. So, so probably longer than 120 years, possibly up to 150 years. Now, that's a long time. Imagine going back 150 years ago and trying to predict the prime minister of Australia or to predict President Trump. Impossible. I mean, you'd say that there's going to be a president of America or maybe a prime minister of Australia a calculated guess, but can you name them? Now, the prophecy, we're not going to read all of these. Okay, I've put the quotes there. You can look them up in your leisure. This individual would come from the east, from the sun's rising, and apparently Cyrus in Persian means the sun. So, so his name fits as well. But he comes from the east, and of course he did come from the east. He would be made king over nations. Now, that's in chapter 41 and verse 2. Who raised up the righteous man from the east, called him to his foot, gave the nations before him, and made him rule over kings. And, of course, Cyrus, he's not called Cyrus the Great for nothing. He became king of the world, king over nations. But the thing that he's noted for in this particular section of the Bible is that he was unlike other kings. He was benevolent and just in the sense that he allowed people to govern themselves and to return to their homeland. He gave a decree, look at it in chapter 44 and verse 28, that saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. So there's the decree. Cyrus made that decree, and 50-odd thousand Jews returned from Babylon back to Jerusalem, and they did eventually rebuild the city and the temple. It was called the Second Temple. But in chapter 45, verse 1, 
God says that this individual would conquer Babylon, who was at that point the, the then known world. It was, it was, well, Babylon hadn't actually risen as the uh, main empire. The Assyrian was still in existence at this time. So Nineveh was the capital of the world. But God knew that Babylon would be the capital of the world. And he said that Babylon would be overthrown by this king who would enter in through the city gates. It says in verse 2, uh, verse 1, I will loose the loins of kings halfway through to open before him the two leaved gates and the gates shall not be shut. So unlike most sieges that take place, you need the battering rams and you crash into the walls and you pull the place down and then you climb over and try and get to the enemy inside. Babylon was conquered by the two gates being opened up. There was not a stone thrown against the city wall. Cyrus was able to march in because they diverted the river Euphrates, got in underneath the, uh, the uh, uh, river, under through the gates, and unlocked, well, the gates were, were unmanned and about to unlock the gates to get the army in. And in one night, Babylon was overthrown. One night, gone. And then down in verse 4, we are told that God says, I'm going to name this individual. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. You, you haven't acknowledged me, but I know you, and I'm going to call you by your name. And so the word Cyrus occurs in verse 28 of the previous chapter, in chapter 44, and in chapter 45, verse 1. Cyrus is named. So imagine, you know, go back 150 years and say, that someone could predict that Scott Morrison could be Prime Minister of Australia. I mean, you wouldn't even know the Morrison family. You wouldn't even have known, perhaps, that there would have been, you know, a parliament like we have today, which didn't happen until 1901. That's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Now, did Cyrus actually do this? Is what Cyrus said here in this decree, true. I mean, can we prove history? It's a historical event, but it's only recorded in the Bible. So far, we've seen tonight. Well, this is in the British Museum. It's called the Cyrus Cylinder, and it records the benevolence of this king. You may not be able to read the side over there, but on this here, it says, I am Cyrus, king of the world, great king. And then on the other side, the text written in a script called Cuneiform claims that Cyrus restored temples in neighboring cities and returned reported people to their homes. So it wasn't just the Jews that he did this to. He did this to many people. This was his character. He was known for doing this. And this is recorded on this Cyrus cylinder. And so that, that's actually our photo. That's why it's not very good quality in the print over there. But this is in the British Museum to be able to go and see and read. What was written on the text for yourself? Now, some might say, okay, all right, so Cyrus said that. I accept that. There's proof that Cyrus said that. But did Isaiah predict this 150 years before? I don't believe that he could have. Isaiah must have been a contemporary or written this after the event. Well, this is quite remarkable. Because these two seals, now a seal, it's a Hebrew term, bulla, is where you had your own personal seal, which you would document things that, uh, with, with wax and stamp your seal into it to prove that it's you. It's sort of like your uh, driver's license today, something that could identify you, personal identification. Well, these two seals were found in 2009, so fairly recent. And they weren't actually revealed to the world until 2015. They were found just at the base of the Western Wall, that corner of Jerusalem in the Ophel excavations, about 10 feet apart, two meters apart, two to three meters apart. And they're two seals. One's complete and the other one's not quite complete. The complete one is the seal that belonged to the famous King Hezekiah. And it actually says on that seal, belonging to Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah. The other seal isn't quite complete. 
It's got belonging to Isaiah, but the archaeologists suggest that there was more to it and that it most likely said belonging to Isaiah the prophet. And of course, Isaiah was always in the court of Hezekiah. He lived in, those, in, in that uh, uh, palace with King Hezekiah. He was King Hezekiah's personal counsellor. But he was a real prophet, not like Paula White, the personal counsellor to Donald Trump. Isaiah was a real prophet, and he wrote these things down. Now, all right, so Isaiah and Hezekiah, the Bible says they lived about the same time. Well, maybe Hezekiah was also much further in history because Isaiah still couldn't have written this and predicted the future. Well, we actually know a lot about Hezekiah, far more than many other characters in the Bible, because there's an event that took place in Hezekiah's life that's noted not just in Jewish history, but also in secular history. A, a major uh, campaign took place. The Assyrian king Sennacherib wanted to encircle the whole of Israel and knock off each of their territories and finally come and crush and conquer Jerusalem. Now, he almost succeeded. He was pretty close. Some of the big uh, fortifications around Jerusalem were taken first. One of them, one of the most famous, was the fortifications of Lachish. So we, we've been to Lachish and uh, stood there at the entrance to the city of Lachish. This is all that's left of the city gates. But look how big those gates were. They were phenomenal. And they went right around, a massive fortification, hold up with soldiers inside this fortification. But of course, Sennacherib came and demolished it. Took the lot. And uh, you can see all that's really left of it today on that mound there. There's the Bible quote talking about it. They've got a little plaque there for it. And, and there's our kids sort of jumping on the equipment there to try and demonstrate in art form the enactment of the siege of Lachish. And to go along with that, they discovered letters that went back and forth between Jerusalem and Lachish saying, hey, look, uh, we're getting a bit worried. Uh, we can't see your signals coming from Ezekiel, which was the other place uh, you might have noticed on, on here that it mentions Ezekiel and Lachish, two fortifications. We can't see. And it was most likely because Ezekiel was gone by that stage. We, we don't actually know the detail as to what prompted this, but, but there's desperation here in this letter. And, and, and that's actually on the, on the site down there in Lachish to be able to read. The amazing thing is, is that in our trip, we, we went across to the British Museum, and in the British Museum, not only do you have it in Israel, the uh, little things that we saw there, the tablets that we saw there, and, and the fortifications that uh, are demolished as ruins. But Sennacherib had the whole of that siege inscribed on a mural right around three walls of this room called the Lakish Room in the British Museum. And it's phenomenally detailed. It shows you uh, on that far left-hand side a picture of Sennacherib sitting there. Someone scrubbed his face out. Probably down the track, another soldier that hated the king has scrubbed his face out. But that's Sennacherib sitting there. You can see on this one here, the soldiers are here and the slaves are here being taken away. And on this one here, you can sort of get the pictorial illustration of the siege and the ramparts and the arches looking up to, and there's the ladders there on the side of the walls of the fortifications at Lachish. So a, a real battle took place. Now, it's possible to date Sennacherib. So Hezekiah had to be around that time, B.C. 700 to 750. And Isaiah was there with him. There's more to Hezekiah than just that. 
because in order to stop Sennacherib from getting into the city of Jerusalem, and remember, they almost did. It was the last fortified city. Hezekiah had a tunnel dug to bring water from outside the city to inside the city. If you're going to be besieged, you need to have food and water. Water was crucial. And this tunnel that was uh, dug is still there today. You can walk through it. And we went through, and if you turn those torches off, it's pitch black. You can't see a thing. You can just hear yourself sloshing in the water. And sometimes a flash flood will come through, and you're sort of reliant on the authorities saying when that, that might happen, but it didn't happen this day, thankfully. And you'll be able to walk through, and you come out the other end. But part of the way through, there's this plaque written by the men of Hezekiah that was discovered on the side of the tunnel wall and it describes how two teams started from opposite ends and met in the middle and they could hear each other about three cubits apart three feet apart and they described the exhilaration of meeting in in the middle um there's one word that they don't quite understand this word zeta for there was Zeda in the rock. They think it might mean a crack in the rock. And that's probably what they followed is a crack. That's why they were able to meet up. So the engineers in Hezekiah's day were able to dig this tunnel. And I was trying to find where the pickaxes from going this direction met the pickaxes going from this direction. I don't know if it's actually this section here, but I did notice that the pickaxes... At this one point, and we're going along with torches, so you couldn't see every single pickaxe, but there was this direct uh, opposite movement in the pick action at, at that point. And uh, they didn't actually say where the meeting place happened, because this is towards the end of the tunnel. But it was just interesting to go through and see Hezekiah's tunnel. But there's more because Sennacherib didn't just do that big mural to put in his library. He also inscribed and recorded it, much like historians do today when they write books on history. And this here is called Taylor's Prism in the British Museum. But there's about three of these and they all record the same thing. All about how Sennacherib caged Hezekiah up like a bird. Notice he doesn't say that he took Hezekiah and took him off to captivity because that's not what happened. But he did encircle Hezekiah and Hezekiah prayed to God. And of course, God helped him from the biblical account. Now, th this is where we say all of that happened. And, and we're sampling, aren't we? All of these things. But now the Bible tells us that the way God sent Sennacherib home with his tail between his legs was that an angel destroyed 185,000 of Sennacherib's army. Now, this is where we go to Hebrews 11 and we say faith fills the gaps. There's, there's no way of proving that 185,000 just simply died. But everything else that the Bible talks about has been recorded in one way or another. So did Isaiah write this in the time of Hezekiah? We believe so. The evidence suggests that. Was Hezekiah 120 or so years before Cyrus? We believe so. He history secular as well as biblical, would suggest so. So this prophecy about Cyrus, we accept, was made by God to prove that he could tell the future. In fact, Josephus suggests, and there's every likelihood that this is probably true, that the reason Cyrus gave the decree to return was because he was shown these prophecies. And shown his name. Look, here you are. You're mentioned in the Bible by God. And so Josephus suggests, and Josephus is, is a historian much later, so you can't accept everything that he says. But he suggests that the reason Cyrus did that was because the great man Daniel showed him where God had named him in Scripture, prophesied him in the Scriptures. Well, what about the other prophecy in Isaiah? Well, we said Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43. Here God makes a prediction about his people. And he predicts that he's going to deliver them from the Babylonians. 
but he's not going to let them escape every single calamity. Have a look at verse 2. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, they shall not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. You're going to go through a tough time, Israel. Things aren't going to be easy for you. But every time you go through those things, I will make sure that you never get extinguished. Because you are witnesses to my existence. Verse 10. Ye are witnesses, saith Yahweh, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. That's the reason Israel continues to survive. No matter how many calamities, gone through the waters, gone through the rivers, gone through the fire, nothing seems to be able to get rid of them. Now, one, we're just going to, look at one prophecy about one of the fires that they went through. Uh, you probably can think of uh, some in recent history with the Arab-Israeli conflict and the odds being on the Arab sides, but the Israelis seem to be able to come through uh, against incredible odds. And then, of course, in the Second World War, there was the Holocaust, where uh, some 6, 000, uh, 6 million Jews were put through Hitler's gas chambers and yet they're there in their land today, and they're a, a nation. They've achieved statehood. But we want to take one that Jesus referred to. So let's go from Isaiah. Let's go over to Matthew 24. Because remember, Cyrus decreed that they could go back and rebuild the second temple. Jesus makes a prophecy about the second temple being destroyed and, and the nation of Israel going through extreme calamity at the hand of the Romans. And of course, this was, this was the, the last thing the Jewish leaders wanted to hear from Jesus. But he speaks this particular prophecy to four of his closest disciples in Matthew 24. In verse 1 of Matthew 24, it says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So he makes a prediction. He makes a prediction about the future as a prophet, as a prophet of God. Now, the temple that the Jews rebuilt when they came back was expanded and updated by Herod in trying to curry favor with the Jews. He really uh, enlarged the, the temple precinct and, and almost doubled its size. And, and you can go there today, and this is looking from the Mount of Olives, See the signpost there saying that we're on the Mount of Olives, looking out over all of those Jewish graves there, the cemetery, out across the Temple Mount, which is on this side of Jerusalem. And you can see it's quite an impregnable platform. And it's still standing. Herod did a, a marvellous job of making sure that it would stand forever. But Jesus said that the temple that was on top of that Temple Mount, not one stone would be left standing upon another. Now, if you go there today, we didn't actually get to go on the Temple Mount this time. Uh, we didn't realize that there were such limited time periods. The Arabs don't let you go on there uh, very often, but you, you can go on there and, and you will not see any evidence of the second temple. There's the Al-Aqsa Mosque and there's the Dome of the Rock, but no evidence of the second temple. But you can go underground to look at the destruction that took place, which much of it stayed exactly as it was since AD 70. They took us down. You can go down. Uh, it's called the Western Wall Heritage. You go down underground. And so that section of the Western Wall that you see outside, it's only about 60 meters long. It continues all the way down that side of the temple. And, and they've excavated right down through to the corner. Actually, it goes right back to the bedrock. 
In fact, they shaped the bedrock to look like stones and merged the two into... It's very clever what, what Herod did. And when we say Herod did it, you know, all his slave workers did it for him. And he did these marvellous building projects. So you can go down underneath and you can go across and stand on... This is a glass. This is actually looking down into the valley that's below. And it's just full of debris. They've left it like that. Just totally full of debris. Exactly how it would have been left in AD 70. And it hasn't really ever been excavated since. All the Crusades and the Muslim invaders have just built on top and left the destruction as it was. Now, just to show you just how massive Herod built this thing, okay, the guide that we had, uh, uh, Leah, I think her name was, she, she was taking us through, she was from Canada, but she, she loved to come and on her uh, visits be a tour guide. And she got two of the kids to go, one in that direction and one in that direction, and to point out, this is the largest stone in the Temple Mount. It's about 33 feet long, about, about 10 meters long, huge. I don't know how they got it there. Really don't know how they got it there, whether they carved it inside or not. But he's pointing at the uh, end of that one on the right-hand side, and she's pointing at the end of that one on the left-hand side, and it's about 33 feet. Now, how does that just topple over? Well, Herod made sure that this was not going to topple over. But the temple on top, Jesus says, would topple over. There wouldn't be one stone left. Now, of course, that happened in AD 70. And uh, when we went to Rome, we went to the commemoration of the siege of Jerusalem that Titus had built, called the Arch of Titus, where he engraved on the sides, the insides of this arch to commemorate the taking of Jerusalem and the Jewish war, conquering the Jews. On the one side, you can see Titus here with his horse parading down. And on the other side, you can see the slaves from the Jewish captives carrying the furniture of the temple, the menorah, taking it into captivity. The temple was destroyed. That's what Jesus said. Now, again, the question is, well, did Matthew or Mark or Luke write these things after the event? So they knew what had happened, and they're just sort of putting it in the mouth of Jesus to make it look like he predicted it. Well, it's a very good question. I mean, that's really what we're looking at tonight. So this is really just my final slide. Just some points to consider about the prophecy that Jesus makes here. So Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70, yet Jesus is suggested to have prophesied this around AD 29, AD 30, in his final year prior to his crucifixion. So that's about 40 years before. So again, go back 40 years and think, what could you predict that would happen with any of the buildings here in Adelaide or in Canberra? It's going to be destroyed, flattened, not one stone left upon another, totally pulled down. Well, some points to consider. Luke's gospel records the Olivet prophecy, just as Matthew, just as Mark, but Luke's gospel is clearly written before another book of the Bible, which Luke also wrote, called the Acts. Luke's gospel comes first, and he follows it up with the Acts of the Apostles. They're like a two-part story. The Acts of the Apostles can be identified as being written before AD 70. We haven't time to look at that tonight, but Luke, that there's, there's uh, things in the record that Luke doesn't know, and he can't record them, and he abruptly finishes Paul's journey because he doesn't know the outcome of Paul's trial. He doesn't, if he'd known the outcome of Paul, surely he would have said, and Paul was acquitted. But he doesn't know that. He writes and abruptly ends it because he doesn't know the end. And Paul was acquitted around about AD 66. So Luke's gospel was probably written before that. So before AD 70. I think that can be quite clearly established. But also, if Matthew knew what happened and was writing after the events, there's some things that are written here that he could have probably have tidied up. What do I mean by that? A later hand would have corrected some details. You might say, what, the prophecy's wrong? No, no, I'm not saying that. The prophecy's correct, but there are warnings here. 
Now, Jesus gives the warnings, but when it came to the event, people acted in a, in a different way to what the warnings were. So, for example, he says in verse 19, And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Now, if Matthew was writing after the event, he probably wouldn't have needed to write that because it didn't happen in winter anyway. The siege took place from April for about five months. And in the northern hemisphere, that's the, the warmer months. It's not winter at all. Why would you suggest that uh, Jesus say, flee in the winter if it never took place in the winter? It reads like someone who doesn't know it's going to take place in the warmer months. And a little bit further up in verse 15 and 16. When you therefore shall see, verse 15, the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Ah, so Daniel prophesied about this as well. So Jesus is not making this a new prophecy. He's saying, what I'm doing is cementing a prophecy already made by Daniel. Go back, read that. If you read it, try and understand it. That's what I'm referring to. But then he says in verse 16, then let him that be in Judea flee into the mountains. Now, Josephus actually records that they didn't flee into the mountains. They fled to a place called Pella, which is down in the Jordan Valley. Why they did that, we don't know. We have no record in scripture of them fleeing to Pella. That's something that comes from Josephus. But they didn't flee to the mountains. But is that wrong? Well, it, it's just suggesting that the writer didn't know where they would go to. Jesus says, Flee to the mountains, get to the high places. But at the time of the event, the best place to go to, it would appear, by those on the ground, was to the safe place of Pella. So just, just some things to think about when it comes to, did Jesus say these before the event? Did Matthew record them before the event? There's every reason to believe that they did. And therefore, that makes the powerful the prophecy of Jesus even more powerful that he could predict this event with such accuracy. And, and you can go to Jerusalem today and see the fulfillment of that. But the point is, is that Isaiah 43 talks about that Israel would never be destroyed and that they would be regathered. We haven't time now to go into any other prophecies. I would just encourage you to have a look at some of those other prophecies that talk about how Israel become the number one prophecy about what God's plan with the earth actually is. We've given you a sample of all these events that can all be tallied up with the Bible. What we invite you to do now is to build on that. And where you can't find absolute proof, let faith develop to, to bridge the gaps. But don't just believe it just because I've said it or because the historians suggest it. Look at it for yourself. Own your own conviction. But I think that you'll, you'll come to the same conclusion as many of us here in this hall have come to, that God does work by history and by prophecy.